and welcome to part 3 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. If you haven't seen the first two parts, what I do is take a look at this really expansive iceberg, which has over 1100 mysteries on it. I give a brief description of each, while offering a few possible theories proposed. Some of the mysteries are kinda boring, or just too complex for me to get into, so on those, I just do a brief summary and move on. If you like the video, I recommend going back and watching the first two. With that said, let's dive on in. Rebecca Corium Rebecca Corium was a British crew member aboard the cruise ship Disney Wonder, who vanished under mysterious circumstances. She was captured by security cameras in the crew lounge having a phone conversation that led to her becoming emotional. A young man would then approach her, and it appeared that he asked her if she was okay, to which her lips are easily read to say, quote, yeah, fine, end quote. Several hours later, she would miss her work shift. The crew would search her room and all the common areas, but the 24-year-old could not be found. The case has gotten a lot of publicity over the years, and it's famous internationally. There's been many good videos made on the topic, so I won't delve in too deep. Instead, I'll just give the key points. After a search in the ocean by the U.S. Coast Guard and Mexican Navy, the cruise liner would dock in L.A., one lone detective from the Bahamas would come to question the nearly 4,500 people on board. Shenanigans began almost immediately, as he interviewed a whopping total of six people, who were all crew members, before he would eventually say it was a rogue wave and go back home. Secondly, Disney would refuse to let Rebecca's parents come on board until the passengers could disembark, making sure they were never able to have contact with them. They would then, along with the ship's captain, meet with the parents and tell them, that she was swept off of deck five of the cruise ship, and that they had recovered one of her flip-flops that still remained on deck. The Coriums would hire a private detective, who would shortly find out that this was a lie, as the flip-flops had a name on them, as well as a room number, that clearly showed it belonged to someone else. Furthermore, he later discovered video footage of Rebecca that Disney claimed came from deck five had been cropped to hide the timestamp and location. He would get to take a look at the unedited copy, and it showed that she was actually on deck one that morning. Why Disney would lie about this is unknown. Finally, in looking at Rebecca's personal items, he found a pair of her shorts that had been ripped. Then, a journalist named John Ronson would eventually take the same exact cruise that Rebecca had been lost on. He began asking crew members what they knew about the case. They all repeated the same line, that she had been washed overboard from deck five. The journalist would go on to inspect deck five personally, and he would record that it would be almost impossible for someone to be thrown overboard or even to jump from there because of the high walls. Furthermore, were the cameras that were all over Deck 5 that would have shown a rogue wave or any accident that could have occurred. As far as the emotional phone call, no one is sure who that was to. She was in a volatile relationship with a girl who was also seeing a man. That girl, Tracy Medley, would speak six years later about the events and claimed that Rebecca jumped to her death, that she was emotionally upset because Tracy did not want a serious relationship with her. She would also claim that she had drug and party habits that could have led to it. One final interesting note in all this was a woman who would contact the Coriums a year later and state that she had seen Rebecca in Venice a few months prior, but it wasn't until she saw her picture online that she put it together and contacted her parents. Normally, I would take this info with a grain of salt, However, for months after Rebecca disappeared, there would be activity on her bank account. Furthermore, her Facebook account, whom her parents had been able to log into, had its password changed and they were locked out. So what do you think happened to Rebecca? Does she really get washed overboard? And does Disney not have the video? Or do they have the video and just don't want the bad publicity? Or worse, did something criminal happen and Disney is covering up? Did they pay the police and crew off? Cruise lines are known to be notoriously sketchy. Or did Rebecca just commit suicide? Or possibly even sneak off the ship at port and start a new life? Renee Hartvelt footage. This one is particularly gruesome, so be warned. In the summer of 1981, Issei Sagawa, who was a Japanese student studying abroad in France, invited Renee Hartvelt, a classmate, to his apartment for dinner and to study poetry. While Hartvelt was reading a poem about death, Sagawa would shoot her with a rifle. What would unfold next was like something from a horror movie. 
he would take an electric knife and start to take meat off of her body. He would consume this for the next three days, cooking several meals while doing other things with the corpse that I'm sure you can figure out. He would finally get rid of the body after this, but he was actually dumb enough to lose one of the suitcases containing the remains in a public garden. He would be found and turned into the police, who quickly traced down the owner and arrested the man. He would be nicknamed the Japanese Cannibal. Now what is the mystery here, you may be wondering? Well, Sagawa would actually record the whole butchery, as well as taking several photographs. The video and photo evidence are presumed to still be in possession of the French police, and likely will never surface for obvious reasons. This is currently sought after by the lost media community, but I can't imagine why anyone would want to watch. Rights. Rights are essentially entitlements to perform or to not perform certain actions as the case may be. This is what forms the backbone of civilizations and basic government, while also shaping morality as we see it. This is another one that I'm not quite sure why the author has it on the iceberg to begin with. I guess maybe he's trying to discuss it in a philosophical sense, like how do we determine what rights are, why some civilizations see some rights as morally just, while others do not. I'm not sure, but I kind of agree with George Carlin's take on it when he said rights are cute and fictional. Schrodinger's Cat This is another mysterious science theory that was made popular by the long-running TV show The Big Bang Theory. And since most people have seen that show, I won't spend a lot of time on this. But basically, it's a thought experiment. A hypothetical cat is placed in a sealed box with a flask of poison and a radioactive source. If an internal monitor like a Geiger counter detects radioactivity, the flask will be shattered, releasing the poison which kills the cat. But it's during this time that the hypothetical cat is considered to be simultaneously both alive and dead as a result of its fate being linked to a random subatomic event that may or may not have occurred. Personally, I always thought this was a dumb thought experiment. I always felt bad for the cat. Scott Clichelte Scott Clichelte is a boy who went missing on June 8, 1988. The nine-year-old boy would leave his home in St. Charles, Missouri that afternoon to go and play in the woods. It was around 4.30 p.m. when he was last seen walking down Ken Drive towards West Adams only one block from his family home. A heavy thunderstorm would hit the area around this time, and his family assumed he had went to a friend's house to wait out the storm. When he didn't return home that evening, the family would search for him, until it got dark, then they would call the police. And thankfully for the parents, the authorities immediately sprang into action. They would canvass the entire neighborhood while also searching the surrounding neighborhoods. They went door to door looking for Scott. The next few days would see police officers, as well as students from the police academy and 40 civilian volunteers, search an area of 20 acres. They would search the woods, the railroad tracks, as well as having some of Scott's friends show the searchers some of the caves that Scott would play in sometimes. They would even dredge up streams but found nothing. They would also use helicopters. A bloodhound would eventually be brought in, and he was able to track his scent for a mile and a half to five miles, depending on the source you read northeast of Fox Hill Road before losing his scent at an apartment building that was under construction. And on June 10th, just two days later, the search would be caught off. By 2007, investigators would take a look at Michael J. Devlin as a possible suspect in Scott's disappearance. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he was the man convicted of kidnapping Sean Hornbeck and William Ownby. Devlin's vehicle at the time matched the description of the one seen in the area that he was abducted from. But, this line of thinking was eventually dropped when they could not conclusively link him. This case would get more attention in 2016, when a Redditor would make a strange confession post that could be connected to Scott. The story details these kids in the 80s who were going back to their base, which was a hill of dirt. When they got there, they saw another boy sitting in the guard chair. This made the other boys mad, and as little boys do, they tried to run him off. And somehow, since the author said he doesn't remember clearly, the boy fell and landed awkwardly, and blood would come out of his mouth. The boys then fled the scene. The now adult who made this confession felt that the boy was dead. And as Redditors do, they would end up checking his post history and realized he lived in the same area as Scott did and was roughly around the same age. Of course, this could have all been a troll post, or maybe it really happened and it was a different boy. Investigators would be notified of the post, and they looked into it. 
but they stuck to their original theory that Scott had been abducted and that they now had persons of interest. Other investigators speculate that his disappearance was related to that of Charles Henderson, who was abducted from Moscow Mills, Missouri, which is about 30 minutes from St. Charles, and happened just three years later. But other online sleuths contend that he was never abducted, but was instead swept away in a flash flood that came from the strong storm that evening. But what do you think happened? Celine Delgado Lopez Celine Delgado is unlike any other missing person case that I have came across. She originally vanished in 1990 in Mexico. And while that in itself is not unusual, the urban legend that came from it is where the mystery lies. On Mexican television Channel 5, there was a segment that ran from the 90s to the early 2000s called At the Service of the Community, in which the host talks about missing people. This was much like a public service announcement that ran between TV show segments. At some point in the late 2010s, someone would discover Delgado on one of these PSAs, and then they would realize that she had appeared on many of them, but what really stood out as odd was her face. It seemed almost fake, like it was generated by a computer. This was spread like wildfire through the unsolved mystery community. It's even been covered by popular YouTubers Nexpo and Lazy Masquerade. The latter, I highly recommend. And since they both have covered it, I think it's probably safe to say most of you all have watched it or are at least familiar with the case. So I won't spend much time discussing the whole is this person real or a computer generated image theory. Instead, I will focus on the very real disappearance of a very real Celine Delgado Lopez. A blogger named Adios Agoraphobia who runs a mystery type blog, would actually make a blog post about Celine in which he released many details about her, confirming that she did exist. For one, he would give Celine's mother and sister's name as point of contacts for the case. He would, however, mention that some of the details provided are out of date, like the contact number that was given. This was actually a store in Celine's neighborhood. And that sounds odd, but this was 1990 in Mexico and the Lopez's were poor. It was common practice to use the neighborhood shop's telephone for any business a person may have had, as many people could not afford a house phone. Sadly, the shopkeeper would state, on the day that he was dying, that someone once called the store with info about Celine. He had never spoke about it until that day. What info he was told has never been released to the public. Another detail the blogger listed was that multiple missing persons programs did segments on Celine. These were much more professional than the clip Channel 5 created, again, verifying that she did indeed exist. He would also note that at one point, there was a much better print of her picture that was being used. He also mentioned a blog from 2006, where a team would go over cases of missing people in Mexico. The team of researchers would do a profile on Celine as well. One of these researchers from the now defunct blog would contact Adios Agoraphobia and offer the info they were able to dig up when they profiled Celine. The researcher would state that Celine disappeared in the morning, that she also had a known stalker, who was a drug addict, that lived a few streets away. Her father died when she was young, while her mother made a living washing other people's clothes. And finally, the most intriguing, was the day that Celine Delgado disappeared. Another woman that lived nearby, who was a sex worker, named Alondra, disappeared as well, and this woman was the prime suspect in Celine's disappearance. Oddly enough though, the researcher would note after this that Celine did leave by her own choice. He would then finish by telling Adios Agoraphobia that one of the researchers were able to contact Celine's sister Laura during the investigation. However, he did not disclose what was said. So the question shouldn't be did Celine Delgado exist? The question should be, what happened to the very real person, Celine Delgado? Seriously, dude, I'm gay. This is an unaired American reality TV show that was planned by Fox. It was going to be a two-hour special set to premiere on June 7, 2004. However, the show would abruptly cancel just 11 days before it was set to air. The show revolved around two straight men in a competition over $50,000. The challenge to win was whoever could pass herself off as the more convincing gay man. They moved into separate lofts with gay roommates. They had to come out to their best friends. They had to socialize at gay nightclubs. 
in addition to competing daily challenges. Not surprisingly, the special would be met with fierce criticism from advocacy groups who claimed that it showed gay men in a negative light, which prompted the near last minute cancellation. Strangely enough, Fox would claim that the cancellation wasn't related at all to the negative press and that it was ultimately, quote, creative issues, end quote, which led to the show's demise. Most of the lost media community seemed to agree that this show will certainly never see the light of day. Sesame Street, Snuffy's parents get a divorce. As early as 1989, the writers of Sesame Street had started contemplating ways to delicately discuss the subject of divorce. The show had touched on other delicate issues before, such as death. However, divorce was a boundary they had never crossed. And after nearly a year of writing and rewriting, the whole thing would be shelved in 1990, when the producer of the show would veto the entire idea and would not even look at a script. However, by 1992, a new script had been written and signed off on by the producer. It was entitled, Snuffy's Parents Get a Divorce, and it's the only episode of Sesame Street to have never been aired. It was originally set to debut on April 10th, 1992, which would have been Sesame Street's 2,985th episode, but ended up being pulled at the last second before it went to air. After receiving extremely negative reaction by children over multiple test screenings, the episode tried to tackle the sensitive subject by depicting Snuffy's parents going through a separation. The children who were test screeners came away confused. Some of them thought that Snuffy's parents no longer loved him and his sister Alice, while others were led to the impression that their parents, like Snuffy's, were also going to get a divorce. It would end up being decided that the topic was simply too difficult for children at that age to fully comprehend, and the episode was scrapped. Outside the original test screenings, the only publicly available footage came from the 50th anniversary special that aired on ABC April 26, 2021. Of course, this is another lost media mystery that's not so mysterious, but the community does hold out hope that one day the full episode will be released. Shadow People Shadow People, aka Shadow Figures, or Shadow Beings, are alleged living beings made of shadow. They are simply outlines and look like a human or some other type of entity. People report having negative feelings when they encounter them. They are often reported to move with quick, jerky type movements and can quickly disintegrate into walls or mirrors. The topic of shadow people have been brought up a lot more in the past two decades, especially on the paranormal show Coast to Coast AM. When in 2001, Art Bell interviewed a Native American elder named Thunderstrikes who discussed the subject. Listeners would be encouraged to send in drawings if they had seen a shadow person. In a bit of a surprise, a huge number of people would share their drawings and stories about their encounters, but this phenomenon actually goes back centuries. The Cherokee believed shadow people were evil and could steal the souls of the dead or seriously ill. Some people have described them as dark silhouettes with human shapes that flicker in and out of peripheral vision. Some have claimed that the figures can jump on their chest and choke them, which sounds a lot like the Hat Man mystery that we looked at before. Although most claim shadow people are evil, some dispute these claims and state that their encounters were either helpful or neutral. But for the most part, it's thought they feed on negative psychic energy, especially when traumatic events have taken place. As for what they are, theories vary, but there are many paranormal ones. Some claim a spirit or demon, some claim extra-dimensional inhabitants from another universe, perhaps trapped or traveling through parallel worlds while others claim that they are alien beings passing in and out of our lives camouflaged within the shadows. Another wild theory is it's really an image of someone else having an out-of-body experience and flashing by us, while it's also been speculated that it's really time travelers passing by to catch a glimpse of our lives. More mundane theories point out that it's probably just sleep paralysis, or the possibility that a person is experiencing heightened emotions, such as walking alone in the dark and they may perceive a patch of shadow as an attacker. Another theory seriously considered is hallucinations caused by sleep deprivation. One fact back in this is that many meth addicts have reported seeing shadow people, which comes after prolonged periods without sleep. One would report, quote, you don't see shadow dogs, or shadow birds, or shadow cars. You see shadow people, standing in doorways, walking behind you, coming at you on the sidewalk, end quote. Other over-the-counter drugs such as Benadryl have also been known to cause people to see shadow figures. Finally, mental illness such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have been known to cause it. 
Shakespeare's Real Birthday Shakespeare is widely regarded as the greatest writer ever in the English language, and although we have many documented facts about the man, one thing escapes us. What day he was born. Historians know the month and year, which was April 1564. However, the day was not recorded, but it's celebrated around the world as April 23rd. This is largely drawn on the fact that his baptism is recorded as happening on April 26th, which was a Wednesday. And baptisms typically took place three days after a new birth. And since the prayer book also instructed parents to baptize their children the first Sunday after birth, it's unlikely that he was born before the 23rd, which was a Sunday, because his baptism date would have reflected that. And since it was not officially recorded, we will never know for sure. Shauna Maynard on August 22, 2015, an anonymous user on 4chan's B-board would start a thread where he made a bold and sickening claim. He would state that he was a serial killer and could prove it. Now before I go any further, I should explain. If you don't know what 4chan or B is, it's an anonymous message board where people post some horrible stuff, while also just posting funny images or trolling. It's really kind of a mixed bag. And on a board like that, what this supposed serial killer was saying, well, it wasn't really that big of a deal at first, because so many anonymous users just make stories up and troll just to get attention. So at first, this was just seen as another drive-by posting as something to troll 4chan. But this, it would end up being true. Sorta. You see, OP, which stands for the original poster of the thread, would state that he wanted others to guess random names of girls. And when someone landed on a victim's name, he said he would lead them to a body he dumped in 1999. Although they were still skeptical, they played along with his game anyways. Eventually, someone would guess a correct name. Op would confirm the users were right and give the coordinates. He would then begin posting pictures of the young woman, some of her when she was alive, some of her when she looked happy to be around whoever the person was taking the pictures, and the other pics? Well, those were the ones of her after she was deceased. Users on B and other boards like X, which is a paranormal board, would start trying to figure out who the victim was. They would start to look at old unsolved cases from 1998 and figured out that it was Shauna Maynard. They would contact the FBI who would get involved. Shauna, who was 17, was found in the early morning hours of April 21, 1998 by citizens at the intersection of Blue Diamond Road and Decatur Boulevard in Las Vegas, Nevada. She had been shot several times and dumped on the roadway. She had been reported missing just a few months prior on December 31st, 1997. The original detective on the case was Sergeant Rocky Alby, and he stated, quote, It is unclear to the detectives investigating the case who Shauna may have been staying with while she was in the Las Vegas area. A few people have come forward and acknowledged knowing Shauna, but also admit there are many things about Shauna Maynard that remain a mystery, end quote. Other than the fact they believe she was a runaway from Norco, California, they had nothing. The case would quickly go cold. It wasn't until 17 years later, when Opp posted the photographs, that the investigation had their first real lead. Or so they thought. After law enforcement started looking into the claim, they would quickly come out and say the whole thing was a hoax. Stating while it was a good thing to get Shauna's case back into the news, the person who posted it caused a lot of grief to the family and was a sick individual. Which leads us to a couple of theories. One being that Opp was somehow able to get a hold of the crime photos and then post them online either by hacking, or he had some connection with law enforcement and intentionally leaked them, or that it was a hoax, as several people have pointed out that the clothes Shauna was found in do not match the pics in the one that Opp posted, unless the so-called serial killer mixed his victims up, which is doubtful. Adding more credibility to this theory is the fact that in one of the photos, the woman that Opp posted was lying on a particular type of sheet. Sharp-eyed posters would recognize that sheet as one used by a coroner or crime scene unit meaning Op was definitely trolling, and most likely had a job that allowed him access to the crime scene photos. Some even speculated that he was a detective. But that leaves the question, who really killed Shauna? The Short Family. This was a small town mystery about a family that was murdered and has never been resolved. I've already did a much deeper video on this, so if you want to watch it, click here. Sightings of Tasmanian Tigers. Tasmanian tigers are a now extinct marsupial that used to inhabit the Australian mainland as well as Tasmania and New Guinea. The animal had actually already vanished from New Guinea 
and Australia before British settlement started. But they would thrive much longer on the island of Tasmania. It's here that bounties would be placed on the predator, as it was known to kill livestock such as chicken. This was the biggest factor in it going extinct. The last one was believed to have been captured in 1930 and died in 1936. But this mystery revolves around supposed sightings of the mammal after its extinction. From 1910 to 2019, there were 1,200 recorded sightings made to the Department of Conservation and Land Management, most frequently reported in southern Victoria. One man named Neil Water started a group that is currently involved in the search for the Tasmanian tiger, as his research has led him to believe there are at least a thousand of them left in Australia. In 2018, a woman reported seeing one to her husband who did not believe her, until 2021, when he saw one with her cubs in the same exact spot his wife had told him about. There's even earlier reportings that go back to the 80s, when a bus full of tourists saw the animal up close in broad daylight during a wildflower tour. But the reports have not been limited to just everyday people either. In 1982, a researcher with Tasmania Parks and Wildlife Services, Hans Narding, observed what he believed to be a Tasmanian tiger for three minutes during a night at the site of Arthur River in northwestern Tasmania, as well as Aboriginal tracker Kevin Cameron, who produced photographs of the animal digging, which he took in western Australia. The most recent recorded sighting is from a video uploaded to TikTok by user Andy underscore B11. In the video, someone in a vehicle sees an animal on the side of the road that looks like a Tasmanian tiger. They record it for a few minutes before it runs off camera. Andy does question, however, if it's the possibility of just being a sick fox. And since there's just so many reportings, it's too many to go over all of them. However, a new theory would be proposed in 2021. It's now thought that the animal may have not went extinct in 1936. Instead, it's possible a small population lasted until at least the 1980s and died sometime after, with the most likely date occurring between the late 90s to early 2000s. This would explain why there's been no video taken. Personally, I would like to believe that the animal is still alive. However, there are currently numerous camera traps, all set up in hopes of snapping a picture or video of the creature, and all of these have failed. Simulation Hypothesis This is another scientific mystery that most people know about. It speculates that the entire universe and all of reality is a simulation. The hypothesis has been made popular in its current form by philosopher Nick Bostrom, who basically argues this. If current forecasts by technologists and futurologists are correct about supercomputers, then at some point, these super powerful machines will be able to run detailed simulations of their forefathers, which means, quote, it is then possible to argue that, if this were the case, we would be rational to think that we are likely among the simulated minds, rather than among the original biological ones. Therefore, if we don't think we are currently living in a computer simulation, we are not entitled to believe that we will have descendants who will run lots of simulations of their forebears." End quote. Most of the scientific community disagrees with Nick Bostrom and calls the simulation hypothesis nothing more than pseudoscience. Some physicists claim that the theory itself is an informal fallacy, whereby Bostrom is assuming the truth of the conclusion instead of supporting it. By pointing out that this is a simulated world, what is the thing that it's made of? What are the laws of this simulated universe? Another argument used against the simulation theory is that if a civilization was so advanced to run simulated universes, they would have already collected whatever data they needed about their past. They would have virtual reality museums and other ways to experience the past, and they would have no need for simulating us. But there are some famous supporters of the theory, such as Elon Musk, who said that we're most likely in a simulation, as well as Neil deGrasse Tyson, who said he thought the chances of being in a simulation is, quote, better than 50-50 odds. I wish I could summon a strong argument against it, but I can find none, end quote. However, in recent years, he has backed off that statement. Whatever the case may be, it's most likely we will never know the truth one way or the other. Sophocles' Odd Death Sophocles was a writer from ancient Greece. Born sometime in 496-497 BC, he is known for writing over 120 plays in the tragedy genre. Of these, seven have survived in complete form. During his era, he was the most celebrated writer in dramatic competitions. He competed in 30, went in 24, and he never placed lower than second. He was the first writer to develop characters much deeper than his contemporaries, allowing viewers to connect with them more. 
but the mystery here is the question of his odd death. It is alleged at age 90 or 91 that he died from the strain of trying to recite a long sentence from one of his stories without taking a pause to breathe, while other accounts suggest he choked while eating grapes at a festival, or that he died of happiness after he won his final writing contest. While the supposed story of him dying trying to recite a story is certainly an odd death, I could not find a source for this. Furthermore, it was common practice in those days to link famous deaths with not-so-common causes. They tend to embellish or flat-out make a more memorable story about a famous person passing. So it's quite possible this 90-year-old writer just passed away from old age and not from one of the quirky stories connected to him. We will most likely never know the truth, though. Southern Television Broadcast Interruption On Saturday, November 26th, 1977, Andrew Gardner, a news broadcaster for ITN, the independent television news, in the UK, was doing a summary of the clashes between Rhodesia and the Zimbabwe African National Liberation Army, when the TV picture would become slightly wobbly, followed by a deep buzz. The audio would then switch to a distorted voice that would deliver a nearly six minute long message. The speaker would claim, quote, This is the voice of Asteron. I am an authorized representative of the intergalactic mission, and I have a message for the planet Earth. We are beginning to enter a period of Aquarius, and there are many corrections which have to be made by Earth people. All your weapons of evil must be destroyed. You have a short time to learn to live together in peace. You must live together in peace, or leave the galaxy." End quote. The interruption ceased shortly after the statement, and the channel would switch back to the end of a Looney Tunes cartoon. Surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, the whole event startled many viewers. Southern television would be flooded with calls from people worried about the announcement. Police would even have to go to an elderly woman's home to help calm her down. Later that day, Southern Television, the channel that it appeared on, would apologize for the event, calling it a, quote, breakthrough in sound, end quote, for some viewers. ITN would say nothing else about the incident until they reported on it during their weekend show. Law enforcement would be contacted, and an investigation began. They found that the television transmitter that was used was fairly uncommon for that time period, as it was one of the few remaining transmitters that would actually broadcast by picking up a signal from another transmitter, thereby just rebroadcasting, or as most modern transmitters were fed by a landline. This made it incredibly easy for someone with the technical know-how to just hack it, just by setting a low-power transmission very close to the receiver. Later on, Southern Television would say, quote, a hoaxer jammed our transmitter in the wilds of North Hampshire by taking another transmitter very close to it." End quote. Many UFO enthusiasts would claim, however, that the whole event was real and that the hacker part was some kind of cover-up. At the time, had the individual responsible been captured, he would have had to pay a $360 fine, roughly $1,700 today. It's kinda odd after all this time, someone has not came forward as the hoaxer as I imagine charges would be dropped by now. There is a video on YouTube of the event, but according to most sources, that's a fake, and was made to try to recreate what viewers would have seen that day, because unfortunately, there's no video that still exists. Even the audio's legitimacy is questioned, as it's believed that this could have been a recreation as well. But the real mystery is, just who was behind the hoax? Or was it a real alien? SpongeBob SquarePants Sailor Mouth Sailor Mouth was an episode of Spongebob which aired in 2001. The episode is somewhat controversial due to the characters Spongebob and Patrick swearing throughout it. It starts after Spongebob and Patrick read off the profanity on the dumpster behind the Krusty Krab, but the words are censored throughout with dolphin sounds. After swearing in front of Mr. Krabs, he tries to stop them, but in the end he accidentally hits his foot on the rock, causing him to say every swear word, again, all censored. SpongeBob and Patrick run to Crab's mother's house to tattle on him, but they all start cussing when explaining the situation. Originally, the voice actors were going to use substitute words. However, they eventually asked Nickelodeon if they could just use the real swear words and then bleep it out with dolphin sounds. So the audio clips of SpongeBob, Patrick, Mr. Krabs, and Squidward saying the actual cuss words are confirmed to exist and are stored in the Nickelodeon archives. Again, this is a lost media mystery which will most likely never be heard for obvious reasons. Star Jelly 
Star jelly is a gelatinous-like substance that is sometimes found on grass or trees. It is translucent or grayish-white and evaporates shortly after it appears, and scientists have no idea where it comes from. It's also been found in huge deposits, like in 1950, when four policemen in Philadelphia reported a, quote, dome disc of quivering jelly, six feet in diameter, one foot thick at the center, and an inch or two near the edge, end quote. When they tried to pick it up, it dissolved into a, quote, odorless, sticky scum, end quote. There's also been stories of vehicles being covered with the jelly after a big rainstorm. Reports of the substance started back in the 14th century. Folklore has always held the belief that the jelly falls to earth during a meteor shower. However, scientists believe that it's most likely some type of fungus, or vomit from an amphibian, or perhaps even a bird. Other theories speculate that it's some type of slime mold or algae. With all that being said, I think it's somewhat refreshing that scientists have no idea where it comes from, and that we do know it exists. Numerous pictures are out there, yet no one has ever actually seen it being formed, and the fact that it disappears extremely quick just makes it even more baffling. Steve Irwin's Thing Ray attack footage. Another lost media mystery that I have no idea why anyone would want to see it. They are such a weird community. Everyone should know the story here, so I'll be brief. Steve Irwin was very popular in the 90s. He was a television personality and wildlife expert most famous for his television show called The Crocodile Hunter. Tragically, however, his life would be ended while filming the documentary entitled Ocean's Deadliest. When he went to swim over a stingray, it struck him in the chest multiple times, puncturing his heart, at which point he was immediately pulled from the water to the yacht above. Strangely enough, the production crew had a rule that was set by Irwin himself, stating that they were not to stop recording, no matter what happened, as Irwin believed that it added real tension to his documentaries. For that reason, the whole thing was captured on video. From the moment he gets hit by the stingray, to the moment of him bleeding out as the yacht raced to the shore. CPR was performed on him by Steve's colleague, but it didn't matter. Irwin's final words were captured on film, when he said, quote, I'm dying. End quote. He would then be pronounced dead by the paramedic on scene. The footage was handed over to Queensland authorities, who gave it to Irwin's family. Supposedly, they destroyed the video, which makes sense. The original camera crew have all stated that they did not keep any footage, and that they suspect that it's been destroyed as well. However, in recent years, a small handful of alleged footage clips have shown up online. They have never been proven to be real. In fact, it's almost always been proven that the footage was edited in such a way to make it look like the attack, or that it was just a video taken out of context. It's most likely gone forever, thankfully. Tabby Star Tabby Star is a star that is around 1400 light years away from Earth. The reason that it's significant, and the reason that it's on this mystery chart, is because of its unusual light fluctuations, including dimming down about 22% in brightness. There have been many theories proposed but none that have been universally accepted. One of the more common theories, though, is that it's an uneven ring of dust that orbits around the star, that dims the light when viewed at certain times. Others have stated it could be a swarm of cold, dusty comet fragments orbiting, but most scientists doubt this. But let's get to the part you really want to hear. Yes, a significant amount of people familiar with the mystery believe that it's due to activity associated with extraterrestrials. Supposedly, it's a sign that aliens are trying to construct a Dyson Swarm around a star. A Dyson Swarm is a hypothetical construct where a super-advanced civilization would construct a large number of solar power satellites and space habitats in a dense formation that would orbit around a star, and then capture and use its energy. Many scientists have chalked this up to nothing more than science fiction, but it really can't be discounted, and as of today, research continues into the odd light of Tabby's star. To mob Shud a.k.a. the Summerton Man. Breaking news, everyone. This is no longer a mystery. Well, most likely not. Although it's been unsolved for a little over 70 years, it was finally solved in July of 2022. You have probably done heard about this, but I'll give a brief summary anyways. The Summerton Man was an unidentified man that was found on December 1st, 1948, on a beach at Summerton Park in Adelaide, Australia. It became known as the Tamab Shud, which is a Persian phrase meaning, is over, or is finished, which was printed on a copy of scrap paper found months later in the man's pocket. The page cut from a book called Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. After police made a public appeal, the book with the torn page would be found. 
On the inside cover, they found indentations from previous handwriting, a local phone number, an unidentified number, and text that looked like a code. And the code was never deciphered. A cause of death was not determined, but the pathologist suggested poisoning. It became one of Australia's most popular mysteries. And with that happening at the time of the Code War and with the poison, many people thought he was a spy. Fast forward to July 2022. Genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick determined that the man was someone named Carl Webb, aka Charles Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker. After some testing, she was able to determine that it was Webb or possibly a brother of his. However, Carl Webb has no death record, meaning it's most likely him. His last known record stated to a year prior in April 1947, when he left his wife, prompting her to file for divorce. Webb liked to bet on horses, which looking at the coded messages now, could have just been horse names. He also enjoyed poetry, which explained the copy of the book. None of the relatives that knew Webb personally are still alive, so they could not be requested for confirmation. Furthermore, there are no other known photographs of the man. Law enforcement is cautiously optimistic, but have still not confirmed the result as of yet. So while it's basically 99% solved, we are still waiting from a legal standpoint. As far as to why he was at that beach, they have a theory for that too. When his wife Dorothy filed for divorce, it showed in the papers that she now lived about 89 miles northeast to Adelaide, meaning it's possible the reason he even ended up there was because he was trying to track her down. And although the mystery is mostly solved, researchers are still trying to figure out some other things, like the cause of death, Tank Man. Everyone has seen this iconic photo. Tank Man is the given name to the Chinese man that stood in front of a column of Beijing tanks during the Tiananmen protest. The tank kept trying to maneuver past the man, but he would repeatedly shift his position to block the path. After bringing them to a complete halt, he would climb up onto the tank and have a short conversation with the tank crew member. He would then get back down, and the tanks would restart their engine. The man would again stand in front of them. It's at this point that two figures in blue would pull the man away, disappearing with him into the crowd, most likely the Beijing police, although some have said that it was concerned bystanders. The whole incident would be captured on film. The photograph that was captured by Jeff Widener has gone down as one of the most iconic photos of all time. The photo is still censored in China to this day, but with all that being said, we still have no idea who the man was, or what happened to him. We don't even know anything about the tank crew. Various theories have been put forth, but with nothing concrete to back it. A British tabloid would name the student as Wang Wailing, a 19-year-old student that was charged with political hooliganism and attempting to subvert the members of the People's Liberation Army. But the Hong Kong-based Information Center for Human Rights disputes this, as they say Chinese Communist Party documents have no record of the man. Bruce Hutchison, former assistant to President Nixon, claims that the man, whoever he was, was executed 14 days later. Other sources say several months later, while Canadian journalist Jan Wong claims from her sources that the Chinese government has no idea who he was and further states he still lives on the mainland. There's also the story from a news agency in South Korea which claimed he escaped to Taiwan and is still employed as an archaeologist in the National Palace Museum. China, for their part, haven't said much. They have denied that he was killed, while not confirming if he received a jail sentence or not. I think what makes this whole incident so interesting is the fact that he was carrying two bags of groceries at the time of the incident. He wasn't some radical protester, just some dude who went to pick up some pizza rolls and milk and decided to peacefully protest standing in front of a tank. Pretty gutsy. For what it's worth, I think at some point, the question of who this man was will be answered. The Butcher in 2019, a Reddit user going by the name DeadUser00 would post a thread to r slash tip of my tongue and then to r slash lost media about a very interesting show that supposedly aired on Nickelodeon in the early 2000s. According to DeadUser00, The Butcher, as they thought it was named but wasn't for sure, was a short film that aired between 2001 and 2004. It was much darker than the other films that were shown at the time. The intro showed a title card in white with a black background as well as the entire film being in black and white. But the biggest thing Dead User 00 remembered was the whole film was puppets made of real animal bones, such as cats, dogs, birds, and rabbits. There would also be a pair of human hands holding the butcher's knife which would chop up the animal puppets. The film also contained scenes of animals inside glass containers, 
and other freaky things like animals fused together to create, quote, an abomination, end quote. The whole film contained no dialogue, only music and sound effects. After describing the film, the National Film Board of Canada, which was associated with Viacom at the time, would search the archives for a film called The Butcher, but found nothing. Dead User 00 would eventually make a follow-up post where he claimed he thought it was a film called Butcher's Hook by Simon Pummel in 1996, but because some of the original details he listed were not in the film, he is only about 90% sure. Although, some lost media followers claimed that it was a well-crafted hoax by Dead User, or that it was a false memory. The Charlie Project The Charlie Project is a website that profiles over 14,000 missing person cases, mainly from the United States. The website is not involved with law enforcement or any other investigation agency, but instead acts like a library of sorts. A library for the public and law enforcement to take advantage in solving cases. They get their data from a variety of sources, including other sites, the news, law enforcement, and by talking to family and friends of the missing person. By doing this, they centralize as much as data as possible into one location. The site takes its name from Charles Ross, a four-year-old boy who was abducted from Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1874. His family would spend the rest of their lives looking for him, and the case gained international attention. He was obviously not the first kidnapping in the United States, but probably was the first highly publicized one. The boy would never be found. The website was started by a woman named Megan Good. She has no personal experience with a missing loved one, but instead became interested in missing people in 1998 and would eventually found the huge database in 2004, just before she turned 19. To be honest, I don't really know why this one is on here. I mean, it's not really a mystery, unless the author was just talking about missing people in general, but that's way too big to tackle in this video. The Fallen Man The Fallen Man is a photograph by Richard Drew of a man fallen from the World Trade Center during the September 11th attacks. The man was trapped on the upper floors of the North Tower, and he is one of the 100 to 200 people that either fell or jumped to their death. The photo has been widely criticized for being disturbing and sadistic. However, others argue that Drew was just capturing the events of that horrible day. But the mystery lies here. Just who was the man? It is believed to be one of two men, Norberto Hernandez or Jonathan Bradley. In Hernandez's case, the day after when the picture started making the rounds, Hernandez's family at first believed it was him, but at some point, they understandably refused to believe that he would have jumped out of the building, and they would start the process of hanging up missing posters and calling hospitals in an attempt to find him. At the same time, though, reporter Peter Cheney would set out to solve the mystery. He would go to New York and see a city plastered with missing people posters, as numerous families were desperate to hopefully find their loved ones. He would take the picture of the fallen man and have it blown up. He was able to see that the man was probably Latino with a goatee, and that he was wearing a white tunic that a restaurant worker may wear. Since Windows of the World, a restaurant at the North Tower, lost 79 employees that day, it stood to reason that it was most likely one of them. Eventually, he would stumble across the missing poster of Hernandez, and compare it to him, and identified the fallen man as Hernandez. But, when he went to speak to the family, they were having nothing to do with it and basically told Chaney to buzz off in a not-so-friendly way. Ever since then, the family has stated that it was not Norberto. Jonathan Briley, on the other hand, also worked at the Windows of the World, was a light-skinned black man that also fit the stature of the fallen man. He also had a goatee and mustache. When the FBI contacted his brother Timothy to come in and identify the body, he stated that the shoes that he was wearing was his brother's, yet something was missing. Timothy would go on to state that he did not recognize any of the clothes that the man was wearing, as he knew his brother had a specific set of clothes he wore to work every day, and this man was not wearing them. Jonathan's family has since stated that they do believe it was him, though. But complicating matters is another food catering service near Windows of the World was called Forte Food. Also lost 21 employees that day, and the majority of them were Indian, Arab, and Latino, and all had short hair and goatees. So there's no real way to ever know who it was. So this mystery will have to endure, and since it's so depressing, I will move on. The Good The Good is a philosophical concept presented by Plato. The definition of good is not the one related to the moral concept of good that we view it as today. Instead, it's about a perfect, eternal, and channelless form that exists outside of space and time. The actual meaning, though, well, it's quite confusing, as philosophers today still debate over it, while many say that even Plato couldn't properly describe it. 
One analogy he does use, though, can kind of give a better understanding, and it's called the analogy of the sun, where he basically states that the sun is not intelligent, yet it allows us to see the world, because even if we had vision, without the sun, our eyes would be useless. He likens that to our mind, which requires the form of goodness, because without goodness, aka sunlight, our mind, aka our eyes, would be useless. Basically meaning that you cannot understand the true nature of reality with just our ordinary senses. So we have to make use of the mind to understand the higher truths of the universe. This is way too deep of a philosophical concept for me, and I may be misinterpreting it. But as I said, it's been debated for centuries, and I think that's where the mystery lies, and that's why it's on this chart. There's even an anecdotal account that when Plato was given his lecture about this theory, that the audience got so confused that most of them just got up and walked out, leaving him there. So I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels that way. The Largest Buyer of Glitter This is an interesting one. In 2018, GlitterX, the country's biggest glitter manufacturer, would do an interview with the New York Times all about glitter, and what seemed like a casual question at first, ended up leaving readers with a perplexing mystery. The journalist, Katie Weaver, would just randomly ask which industry purchased the most glitter. Miss Dyer, who was the Glitter X representative, would immediately shut down and would not provide an answer. This kind of stunned Katie, as she didn't think it was that big of a deal. She would then ask Miss Dyer to clarify, did she not know, or did she know and couldn't say? To which Miss Dyer would state that she knew that she was not allowed to say. She would go on to state you would never guess who it was, and that it's used in such a way that you wouldn't even know glitter was in it. That's all she would disclose. The journalist would try to get Miss Dyer to tell her off the record, which she wouldn't. So of course this made a lot of people super curious. First, where exactly is this glitter being used in such a way that you wouldn't even be able to tell that it was glitter? Secondly, why is the manufacturer so insistent on keeping it secret? The glitter conspiracy of 2018 as it would come to be known brought us several theories. One prominent one was that it was connected to the military. Specifically, a stealth coatings on military aircraft like the F-22 and the F-35 fighters, or even spacecraft. That would certainly make sense as to why it was being kept classified. However, one thing going against this argument is we know the automotive industry is one of the biggest markets for glitter, and it's hard to imagine that the military needs anywhere near the amount of glitter per aircraft that the entire automotive industry needs. Another theory proposed was cosmetics or toothpaste or even shampoo, conditioners, lotions, etc. But here lies the issue. Mrs. Dyer said you would not be able to recognize the glitter. Surely we would see it in toothpaste or cosmetics. One of the other most widely held and believed theories is that it's used in explosives and microtagants. Microtagants are microscopic particles that are used to identify and trace explosives. It's just possible that they put an identifiable type of glitter in a commercial explosive in order to track them after detonation which obviously would be used to track down any potential terrorists that used it. Another believable theory is that it could be put into dollar bills to prevent counterfeiting, and one podcast attempted to link the mystery to boat paint, which could make sense when you take into consideration all the cruise line ships and their sizes. Other less believed theories is that it is used in rocket fuel, or put into sand for aesthetic purposes, since we are running out of sand, or on fishing lures, cheap jewelry, as to why any industry would want to keep it secret. That's because glitter is terrible for the environment, taking up to a thousand years to degrade. They probably don't want to be linked to that. As of today, no one has conclusively linked which industry buys the most glitter. Multiverse. This is another famous hypothetical that has gotten more mainstream popularity in the recent years. Basically, the theory states that there are multiple universes that occupy the same time and space as ours, but cannot be observed by us or us by them. The theory divulges here as there are numerous theories as to why we can't observe them, ranging from the quilted multiverse theory, which states that if we have infinite universes with infinite amount of space, every possible event will occur an infinite amount of times, to the simulated multiverse theory, which states the entire universe could be a simulation on a supercomputer, and that computer could run multiple universes. That one ties in with the simulation hypothesis that we discussed earlier. But there are many more theories, too many to go over here. Physicists are heavily divided over the multiverse theory. The skeptics claim there is no way to test such a thing, while others claim multiverses are more a question for philosophers and not for physicists. Regardless, this mystery is one that won't likely ever be answered. Toynbee tiles, aka Toynbee plaques, are messages of an unknown origin found embedded in asphalt on streets in about two dozen major cities in the US and four South American cities. 
There have been at least several hundred tiles discovered since the 80s. They are usually about the size of a license plate, but sometimes larger. Although some of the inscriptions vary, they generally say something like, Toynbee Idea, In Movie 2001, Resurrect Dead, On Planet Jupiter. They are usually put into busy intersection by a very clever method. It seems they are wrapped in tar paper, then coated with glue, then placed in the asphalt through a hole in the car's floor. The tiles are then pressed into the asphalt by cars driving over them, while the glue holds it in place. As vehicles continue driving over, the tar paper tears away leaving the message. The first confirmed sighting came in 1983, but there are other unconfirmed reports that they were spotted as early as 1975. They wouldn't however get their first media appearance until 1994. The tiles range from as far as Kansas City, Missouri, as far north to Boston, and as far south as Richmond, Virginia. It is believed after 2002, the copycats would start doing the majority of the tiles, especially outside of Philadelphia, as it seems the original artist has only left new ones in Philadelphia, one in Connecticut, and one in New Jersey. Which makes sense, as it's believed the original artist lives in Philly, as the vast majority of them are there, as well as one in South America that mentions a street address in Philadelphia. The occupants of that house say they knew nothing about the tiles when they were first asked. The meaning behind the tiles along with the creator has long been a mystery. The Toynbee phrase relates to Arnold J. Toynbee, an English historian best known for his theory that humans' perception of its history shaped its future, or the Ray Bradbury short story called The Toynbee Convector, which is based on Toynbee's theory. The Jupiter part of the phrase could be linked to Arthur C. Clarke's short story called Jupiter 5, where a spaceship named Arnold Toynbee was on a mission to Jupiter, which also ties into the other part of the phrase, movie 2001, which is believed to be a reference to 2001 A Space Odyssey which is about a mission to Jupiter. As far as who was behind it, that's a little bit more mysterious. In 1983, a man identifying himself as a social worker named James Marasco contacted talk shows and newspapers with his theory of colonizing Jupiter with the dead inhabitants of Earth. Claiming he got the idea after reading a book by Arnold Toynbee, he discussed how Toynbee's book contained a theory on bringing dead molecules back to life, like it would later be depicted in 2001 A Space Odyssey. In 2011, the documentary called Resurrect Dead, The Mystery of the Toynbee Tiles, artist and Toynbee tile enthusiast Justin Deere found that the artist was most likely a recluse living in Philadelphia named Severino Verna that used the alias James Marasco, his reasoning being that the streets surrounding Severino's residence were littered with smaller tiles, almost like test tiles. Verna was also known to use ham radio, where it's been reported that other ham operators heard him talking about his Jupiter theories, and the last major final clue was all of Severino's neighbors said he had a car with no passenger seat, meaning he could have had a hole in the floor on the passenger side to lay out the tiles. Truth. What is truth? This is a long debated question, even showing up in John 1833, when Pontius Pilate asked, what is truth? This has been studied more since the turn of the 20th century, and philosophers have found a few problem cases with the truth, such as, can claims about the future be true now, even if they haven't happened yet? And what about sentences like, I'm lying, which is a paradox, or this sentence is not true, which is another paradox. But what about sentences that state something is morally wrong? For example, someone saying, eating meat is wrong, which is made from their own moral conviction. Is that a fact if the person believes it? Then what about the person that disagrees? Are they lying? This is some of the rabbit holes that the truth discussion goes down into. And again, this is something I've never even really thought about. But there are several theories for what truth is. The most popular one was actually thought up by Plato and by Aristotle's book Metaphysics. The theory says that a statement is true, provided there exists a fact corresponding to it. While the coherence theory says that the truth of a statement comes from its relationship with events in the world. For example, if a drunk man says a pink elephant is in the street, we are coherent enough to know that he is lying because we know elephants are gray, we know there's no elephants nearby, we know that drunks can hallucinate, so we are filling info in for the statement based on what we know of the world, to know that the drunk man is lying, although he might think it's true. There are several other theories, and I can make a really long video about it, but I have to tell you the truth. This one just isn't for me. Tully Monster Tully Monster is an extinct animal that lived in the shallow tropical waters about 300 million years ago. The fossils have came from only one place, that of the Mazan Creek fossil beds in Illinois. The creature had a mostly cigar-shaped body with a triangular tail fin, two long stalked eyes, and a proboscis tipped with a mouth like an appendage. 
It is believed the creature was an underwater carnivore, but the mystery lies in the fact that scientists don't exactly know what kind of animal it was, making its classification controversial. Some have said it's a mollusk, like an octopus. Others say an anthropod, like a crab. It could have been a worm, or maybe even a vertebrae. Others say it belongs to a now extinct class. The point is, we simply don't know. Debate over the creature has went on for over half a century with no answer. Although a team of researchers did state in 2016 that they now believe the animal was an invertebrate. However, this is still being disputed as the debate goes on. UFOs. I certainly don't have to tell you what this one is. Everyone should know what UFOs are. And everyone should know what the mystery is. Do they really exist? One thing to note before we start is UFO sightings have went on for centuries, with some accounts coming from early Rome, yet they didn't become culturally significant until after World War II and leading up through the Space Age. In particular, it started on June 24, 1947, when civilian pilot Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine objects flying in formation near Mount Rainier. He described them as saucer-like, leaving the newspapers to call them flying saucers. Soon reports would start popping up all over. In 1961, the first alien abduction account became a media sensation when Barney and Betty Hill claimed to have been abducted. The most recent notable unexplained case was the Phoenix Lights case on March 13, 1997, in which thousands of people reported seeing UFOs in the states of Arizona and Nevada. The UFO debate falls into two camps, those that think they are aliens, which we'll get to, and the skeptics who believe in the more mundane possibilities. Those possibilities are as follows. Astronomical objects, like stars and bright planets, other aircraft, especially secret military aircraft that's being tested, space debris, weather balloons, light phenomena like ball lightning or moon dogs, and then the possibility that the individual that witnessed the UFO could have seen an optical illusion or hallucinated, and finally, hoaxes. And although the government has always been quick to write off any UFO sightings, numerous governments in the world, including the US, have launched investigations looking into the phenomenon. Of these studies, a few noticeable trends have stood out. First, about 90% of reports would be solved after a little investigation, and chalked up to one of the aforementioned explanations I just went over. Of that 90%, surprisingly, only 1% or maybe even less was hoaxed. But the interesting part is that final 10%, which can never be truly explained. It's these 10% that skeptics and UFO enthusiasts disagree over. Skeptics claim this 10% is only unexplained because there's not enough data to thoroughly know what it is, and insist that UFO enthusiasts are trying to place aliens in the craft with no evidence backing it. And that's the problem with UFO and alien believers. Their only proof is eyewitness testimony, which is notoriously shaky. However, one thing backing them came in 2017, when the US government would release a set of videos called the Pentagon UFO videos, which are selected recordings of cockpit instrumentation from the US Navy fighter jets aboard the USS Nimitz and the USS Theodore Roosevelt. The US government has officially listed them as UFOs and have no explanation for them. Skeptics, however, claim that it's most likely an instrument reading malfunction. So the debate goes on. What do you believe? Ultimate fate of the universe. Have you ever wondered what will eventually happen to the universe? Yeah, me neither. But apparently a lot of really smart people have, and none of the fates are pleasant. The most likely scenario for our universe is to end up in what cosmologists call the Big Freeze, aka the Big Chill. A scenario in which continued expansion of the universe would lead to absolute zero temperature. And no, I'm not talking about zero degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit. I'm talking the zero point of thermodynamic temperature, which comes out to about negative 459 Fahrenheit or negative 273 Celsius, which of course would be too cold to support any life. Another widely held theory is the Big Rip, which is exactly what it sounds like. As the universe expands and expands and expands, all matter in the universe would start to rip, from stars and galaxies to atoms and particles. Even space-time itself would rip. The Earth and everything in it would be disintegrated. Others have speculated a big crunch scenario that is the opposite of the big rip. At some point, the expansion of the universe would stop and then reverse onto itself until eventually collapsing down to there's absolutely nothing, leaving everything and everyone inside crushed to nothing. However, this is the least likely. Another one is the big bounce which is based on the Big Crunch. But it states after the universe is crushed, down to nothing, a new Big Bang happens and a new universe begins. After millions of years, the universe gets crushed again. A new Big Bang happens and a new universe begins. And it bounces on and on forever, meaning there could have been several universes before us. 
In all honesty, there's not enough data for any of these, and there's no real way to know how it could end. So I chalk these up to sci-fi theories and not mysteries. Yumi Bazoo. Yumi Bazoo is an alleged sea spirit slash cryptid that has been spotted multiple times throughout the waters off of Japan. They usually appear within the calm waters and clear skies in seemingly perfect conditions, putting the sailors at ease. They then rise suddenly from the surface of the water, sometimes flipping or breaking the ships in the process. Heavy winds then occur with a dramatic shift in the weather. A giant black head would then lurch upwards and upside the ship sending sailors into the water. They are massive, around 30 feet tall, although smaller ones around a few inches to a few feet tall have been spotted and are thought to be the juveniles of the creature. They are roughly humanoid in shape, with inky black skin and a pair of large eyes. Descriptions vary on the creature, as some have described it looking like a sperm whale, while others have said it looks like a beautiful woman and then it changed into a vicious monster. However, the most reported look is the giant black head with massive eyes. They never raise more than halfway out of the water. Their name translates to sea monk or sea priest, and they get that name because of their head, which resembles the shaved head of a Buddhist monk. When they do actually attack, they cling to the hull of a ship and drag it under, or as legend has told, use their long stretching arms to pull a ship down by the mast. Some reports claim that it will try to quench out any fire on deck while other legends claim that the creature can be repelled by tobacco smoke. Even when the monster is not attacking, just seeing one usually brings something bad, usually a terrible storm, or it may simply just leave the men with a heavy sense of dread. Most experienced fishermen would read the signs that the spirit was about and would refuse to go out into the waters. Although the origin of the creature has been lost to time, we do know some reports go back to at least 1789, when a collection of writings told of a report of a Yumi Bozu that rose out of the water stayed visible for three days, and then returned to sea. In 1888, a newspaper would tell of a 7-foot-long, 570-pound monster that was spotted. It was light brown, with orange eyes, and mouth like a crocodile, and tail like a giant shrimp. The most recent account happened in April 1971, on a tuna fishing ship near New Zealand. The stories varied depending on the source, but basically, a crew encountered a giant creature, either by hoisting it up in its lines, or when the net's lines were suddenly cut. Then the creature surfaced. Regardless, the captain and the crew panicked. The monster was brown, deep gray wrinkled skin, and eyes were about five inches in diameter. There was no nose or mouth, only half of the body was visible, and the other half was hidden by the murky water. But what they could see was about five feet long. They claimed to try to poke it with a harpoon, but the monster disappeared into the sea. Of course, skeptics disagree, and state that the most likely origin of what sailors reported seeing or sea turtles, or maybe a massive jellyfish, possibly even a black thunderhead cloud in the distance, but recent speculation has cited that rogue waves are the most likely culprit. Unfavorable Semicircle On April 5th, 2015, a channel on YouTube called Unfavorable Semicircle would begin to upload large numbers in the tens of thousands of unsettling videos. The content featured visuals that were blurry, often featuring dark tones with bunches of dots and seemingly random arrangements. The audio is what spooked most viewers, though. The video would sometimes feature a man with a heavily muffled voice, reciting assorted letters and numbers. The average clip was four to five seconds, but there were also longer ones, some that went for 11 hours. With a few exceptions, the names of the video started with an astrological symbol for Sagittarius. By February 22, 2016, the BBC would post a story about the whole weird affair, and within hours, YouTube would suspend the channel. Then three days later, the channel was terminated. A Twitter account with the name Unfavorable Semicircle would be created after this, and it would post the puzzle. The puzzle led to a new YouTube channel. This would happen a couple of times, and followers aren't even sure if it's the original Unfavorable Semicircle or not. Due to the large amounts, usually two to three videos every two minutes, and the weird content, the channel would begin to pick up steam, and people would begin to investigate. There would be a subreddit created, as well as a website to try to crack the mystery behind it. Theories would begin to emerge, such as a modern-day number station, alternate reality game, recruitment puzzle, marketing campaign, work of a disturbed mind, or maybe even a bot. However, none of these has ever been confirmed one way or the other. Felisca Axe Murders This is one I did a much deeper video on. It's an unsolved murder of a whole family in 1912. If you would like to watch, click here. Walker Family This is another unsolved murder of a whole family. 
It takes place in 1959, and I did a much deeper video on it here. What existed before the Big Bang? This is another big brain argument, and it's just too much for me to dive into, and it's kind of a bore. I admit science is my weak subject. However, the mystery is, just what existed before the Big Bang? How did something come from nothing? The question has a lot of hypothetical theories, but like most scientific mysteries, none of it can be proven. The question itself is regarded as a flawed question to many people, as many state that because time and space came to be during the Big Bang, one cannot simply ask what happened before time, because that is a paradox. But scientists point out that time is a man-made measurement, and it doesn't really exist, and offer the alternative. The Big Bang belongs to a cyclical infinite loop. The matter, energy, and present have always existed, and it's constantly transforming, perhaps towards the end of the universe, when all the material from the Big Bang is consumed into a black hole, where it then spits out another Big Bang on the other side. This is basically the Big Bounce theory we discussed earlier. Another likely scenario is that before the Big Bang, the universe was just an infinite stretch of ultra-hot, dense material, persisting in a steady state until the Big Bang occurred. While other states there was no before the Big Bang, that everything started with it. This will probably never be answered. Wrinkles the Clown This is a neat little interesting mystery. Wrinkles the Clown is a character created by an unknown performance artist living in Naples, Florida. The whole gimmick is part of an elaborate art project. Wrinkles is supposedly a homeless old man who dresses as a clown and hires himself out to parents to scare kids for a few hundred dollars, where he offers to come to their homes and frighten misbehaving children. He first appeared online in 2015 on YouTube, depicting him emerging from beneath the young girl's bed in the middle of the night. He would start popping up in several more videos, either frightening children or engaging in creepy behavior such as waving at motorists from a darkened roadside. Then stickers around Florida would begin to be spotted that featured the clown's face and a telephone number. This quickly caused Wrinkles to go viral. By that November, the Washington Post would decide to do an interview with Wrinkles where the 65-year-old man revealed he was a retired and divorced veteran who moved from Rhode Island around 2009. He was bored with being a retiree, so he created wrinkles and bought his distinctive mask online and made stickers and business cards promoting his number. He would grow in popularity as many Florida teens started posting photos of wrinkles on social media. Wrinkles would go on to say that he is now receiving, quote, hundreds of phone calls a day, end quote. So simple resolved mystery, right? Well, no. Because in 2019, a documentary would be made called Wrinkles the Clown, and it would actually debunk this whole Washington Post article. It turns out the retiree was just an actor, and he got hired to pretend he was Wrinkles. The real Wrinkles was conceived by a much younger man. Looking further into the mystery reveals on February 3rd, 2016, filmmaker Kerry Longchamps would start a Kickstarter campaign to raise money for a documentary about Wrinkles. It ended up being unsuccessful. However, Longchamps was chiefly behind the viral marketing efforts of Wrinkles in the early days, and it would be eventually discovered that some of the early videos of Wrinkles were actually recorded at his house. Longchamps has stated since that it was purely a coincidence, but it's most likely that he is either the man behind the mask, or he's helping a friend that is. Finally, the Collier County Sheriff's Department would be interviewed, and they would verify that no clown sightings have ever been called in prior to 2016 clown sightings that we previously discussed which means that most likely every video and picture with Wrinkles was all actors having premeditated actions with the actor. For what reason and who's behind it is still a mystery. Zodiac Killer This may be the most famous unsolved murder case in American history, so for that reason, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Because if you are a mystery lover, or you are a true crime lover, you have almost certainly heard the details of this case multiple times. The Zodiac murdered five known victims in the San Francisco Bay Area, between December 1968 and October 1969. He mainly targeted young couples and one lone male cab driver. There were at least two survivors from other attempted attacks. Making him more infamous was a series of taunting letters he mailed to newspapers, threatening more killings and bombings if his letters were not printed. He also boasted to have killed 37 victims. And while there have been several code cases from Southern California linked to him, at least 20 to 28, none of it's conclusive. Some of the letters contained ciphers as well, in which the killer claimed to be collecting his victims as slaves for the afterlife. Of the four written, only two remain unsolved, with the last one being cracked in 2020. The last official communication from the Zodiac came in 1974, 
Although there were numerous letters that poured into the papers way up to the late 70s, none of those can be confirmed as legit. There have been numerous suspects over the years, but only one that authorities ever named publicly, and that was Arthur Lee Allen, a former elementary school teacher and sex offender that died in 1992. And even Allen was largely suspected on circumstantial evidence. Even though he was interviewed early in the investigation, and was subject to several searches over a 20-year period, detectives were never able to find evidence linking him to the crimes. He was mainly suspected of being behind the Zodiac killings when he was spotted in the vicinity after one of the attacks, and also because Allen's own friend would go to the police and report that Allen had spoken of his desire to kill people, and that he used the name Zodiac, and that he had secured a flashlight to a firearm for visibility at night. And maybe the most famous part of the story, though, was when a police officer is believed to have passed the Zodiac fleeing from the Stein killing. This has been a key part to the story, as the officer in question did not stop the man. The officer has always claimed that Allen weighed about 100 more pounds than the man he saw fleeing the scene, and added that his face was too round, which contradicts one of the survivor statements that said Allen was definitely the Zodiac. But a partial DNA profile on a stamp was compared to Allen, and it was not a match, pretty much excluding him from the crimes. After this, the list is way too long and expansive to get into, and besides, almost every suspect proposed has been virtually eliminated. The case will most likely never be solved. That brings us to the end of Layer 1 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg. It's been a great journey thus far, and I appreciate anyone who's followed to this point. We have went over 135 mysteries together, but we're just getting started. I look forward to the next layer when we start taking a peek at some of the more unknown mysteries. I hope to see you there.